Now, when the wall had been built and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot, and while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few, and no houses had been rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came at the first, and I found written in it, These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. There are 73 verses in Nehemiah chapter 7. It's a list of all the men in Israel. It's a long list with many difficult names to pronounce and remember. Uh, It would probably take me another 10 minutes to probably read through them, so we're not even going to try this morning. But if Nehemiah felt it was important to write them down and to mention these names, I do want to encourage you to go and read them after the message. So they've done it. They've finished the wall. What was impossible for 140 years happened in just 52 days. They found the way. Not a way, not some way, but the way. Together. Let's take in this scene here. Thousands of people. They've been scattered, divided, defeated, deprived for 140 years. Why? Because Israel as a nation became wicked. How did they become wicked? Like today, they took a vote. And the majority chose rebellion. The minority, those who wanted to be faithful to God, they were outvoted. The majority, they thought that following God was optional. King Zedekiah, he was was the king of Judah. He was 21 years old, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not regard the ways of God. Therefore, God sent a pagan king who took all the things of value and destroyed Jerusalem. He killed their young men, and he enslaved the survivors. They hadn't just seen difficult times and terrible loss. This was a daily reality for them. And now, for the first time in their lifetime, they had something that resembled the days that they had only once heard about. Nehemiah, just a regular guy who loved God, who loved truth and pursued obedience, was placed before the king as a cupbearer. Nehemiah was was moved by God, not not just to restore Jerusalem, but return the people of Israel to their God. Yahweh empowered this man to organize, unify, and accomplish this task. But how is just some guy going to do this? That's the question that we're going to spend the remainder of our time on this morning. How do you unite a people who have different wants, different needs, different ambitions, different agendas. They're strangers in their own land and to one another. How do you bring together vastly different people and motivate them to a a central focused joint mission? I don't know what your favorite sport is. Maybe it changes with the seasons, but let me show you a sport that captures on a micro level what we see happening in this text. Impressive, isn't it? These guys are some of the fastest in the world. When a handful of people can get it together and pull together and work as a seamless machine, it's so impressive because it's so rare. It requires something that just doesn't happen naturally. Everyone in that boat wants and works for the same end, the same purpose, objective, and outcome. But that is work, which seems to be a dirty word today. But in that boat, every person not only knows their role, but consistently and flawlessly executes that task. And there's a dependent trust that each member will do their individual part, and that doesn't happen naturally. Not all of, all of us are cut from that kind of cloth. 
Long before that video was produced, before this team spent hours in training together, a coach did the grueling work uh, and made the difficult decisions. Who, who will he keep and who will he send home? But this team was, forced through a, uh, was, was formed through a selection process, uh, what's common and familiar for, for all sports. Uh, not everyone who tries out for the team makes the cut. What's pretty common to all teams there are people who are more of a liability than an asset. They're just kind of coasters, coasters, you know, people who want the jersey, but they're not willing to put, in, put forth the effort. Still others will work, even have the skills, and, and, and they'll pull their own weight. But their biggest problem is that they've, they've got the heart, they've got the, the gifts, the needed commitment and determination, but it's that cooperation with the larger group that's the real issue. They're not team players. A coach pulls from the many to form a team of the few to identify and to cut the dead weight that otherwise would hold up the team. When finished, we marvel year after year at the finished product. It's beautiful. But what you need to see is we're supposed to have another picture up here of uh, Barberton. Yeah, there we go. That is not that, right? We've got a city and a boatload of people. This story is not about a team of four to nine people. Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 66 says the whole company numbered 42,360. So we're talking about 42,360 people coming together. So let me put this in perspective for you. You could combine Barberton and Norton, Ohio. So if we combine both of those, that number would still come up short. Barberton and Norton combined is still only 36,554, but it's close enough. Imagine with me, everyone in the Barberton-Norton area coming together. And I know some of you are like, no way that'll ever happen. <laughs> Perfect example then. But imagine everyone coming together for one task, one purpose, united under one banner, where all the typical divides are readily cast aside and they, they unite to accomplish one single task under God. Jointly cooperate, caring for each other, protecting, providing for each other. It's impressive when it's four to nine people, but 42,360? The closest I've ever come to seeing something like this was a 1997 Promise Keepers Conference for Men. The only, the only time I've ever been on the inside of an NFL stadium. The, the Promise Keepers event was in Buffalo, so whatever their stadium is called, I'm really not sure. We, we sat in the upper deck, the highest seats. It was pretty terrifying. But at the same time, it was so moving and inspiring watching all of these men from who knows where worship God together. They came together for one purpose to be men after God's own heart, who would lead our nation, starting with leading in their homes. It was amazing. But this movement is unlike our sports team concepts. It's not about how bright or strong a, a few can be. It's not, it, it wasn't about a few star players or how fast someone can run the 40-yard dash, but how they could function together. The success of this mission would not be measured by the performance of a few of the strongest on the team, but by the, how the strongest on the team incorporated the weakest. It wasn't about how fast one of them could move, work, or build, but how fast they could all work together. And you can only move as fast as the slowest person. What's that saying? A, a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link? Don't forget the circumstances that exacerbate an already stressful situation. The local people are hostile towards them. They're organized under political officials who, who've given permission to, to, and the power to threaten the lives of not just the leadership, but all the people who are working on this project together. Remember, the people working on this project are poor. They're hungry. This is happening all in the middle of a famine. And there's no FEMA coming to provide food and relief. And that's not all. 
For now, the city is pretty large and it's pretty spacious, but there were a few people in, the, in it, and, and, and the houses still had yet to be rebuilt. The homes that belonged to these people building the wall, they, they're not just in shambles, they're in pieces. Think about this. The, the, they're fixing a wall, right? They're fixing this wall, and the whole time they're fixing this wall, their homes within these walls sit in complete ruin. It reminds me of those stories that we've heard about, you know, like the police officers or firefighters or good Samaritans who go in and they save someone else's home as their home burns to the ground. Few of us, that, that's a level of sacrifice that few of us understand in here. Have you ever sacrificed yourself, your, your comfort, your safety for the needs of others? Let me help you understand this on a, on a micro level here. Have you ever gone to the stove to pick up a, a hot pot, you know, of soup, or for some of you, maybe the microwave, or grab a pan that after you grabbed it, 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 you realized, and you started moving it to the table, and you realized that this pan is a little hotter than you first thought, hotter than you can comfortably handle. You got a microsecond to choose. Do you, do you drop it and throw the family's meal on the ground? and maybe splash everyone with its hot contents, or do you hold it for a few more seconds and transport it to a safe location at great expense to yourself so that others can enjoy the sustenance it contains? What do you do? What do we do when, when what is needed for others comes at a steep price for yourself? when the act to help others comes out of your own personal hurt. I'm certain we've all had our, our moments where we've gone without so that someone else could have. But have you ever seen that done in mass with, with that many people? It, it's one thing to see a group or an individual behave this way, but a nation, an entire people? We, we like to think of ourselves as, as civilized. We're, we're civil people. So in today's time for all our societal progress. Tell me, how would you perform today under similar circumstances? Displaced from your home for longer than you've been alive. Your home has been destroyed. You're hungry every day. You're also under threat by those who are living on your property. You're crammed in like sardines with, with complete strangers, so you're claustrophobic. Can, can we all agree we all have our difficult moments? Some of us are not morning persons. We're tired, we're cranky. Some of us, when we get hungry, we can, we can get a little grumpy. I'll be the first to admit that if I don't get a nap, especially on a day where I lose an hour of sleep, I'm not the most pleasant person to be around. Some of us are short on patience. And once it runs out, everybody knows. Some of us, when we get stressed out, we can get a little testy. Some of us, when we're threatened or put under pressure, our personality kind of changes a little bit. Can you imagine all of these are happening to these people all at the same time? All of these frustrations and emotions are all happening to these people during this rebuild. And yet we don't see 42,360 cranky people. But we see a nation cooperating and working together. We see people united on, in one cause, purpose, and mission. And not for a day, but for 52 days. I can see how you could get a group of four to nine men or women to sit in a boat for a couple hours and to row for a win. But for 52 days, 42,360 people? When we read this text, few of us understand what they were up against. And what they had to overcome together. What are we like, maybe a hundred in this room? Is, is there anything in here that we could work together for like that? Are we in this room united this way? If not, could we unite this way? If so, what would be the cause? Do you know what Maslow's hierarchy of needs is? It's the idea that 
humans need the, to have these five basic needs met for us to function the way that we're supposed to. Now, I don't want to get into what they are. I mean, you can kind of read them there, but if you, want to, if you want to look it up later to get a little bit more context about what we're talking about here, that's what it'll look like if you look it up. So what I want you to see is, is, is that this situation in Nehemiah, it completely throws that out the window. Because most of their needs are not being met in this moment. They're under threat. They're in need. They're hungry. They're desperate. And for 52 days, they built a wall as their homes sit in ruins. There was, there was a reason nothing happened for 140 years before Nehemiah came Built into us is a desire for self-preservation. We, we call it survival instinct. When pressed, when in danger, our natural reflex is to save ourselves. Watch people in a crisis, and you'll see most of them running from the danger. It's rare for people to exemplify their best qualities in moments of desperation. But if you watch, there are a few in almost any situation who do something different than the majority. They abort the normal process of saving themselves to save others. Have you ever put yourself in danger, put yourself at risk of severe injury to save someone who isn't your family member? It's way easier to come apart than it is to come together. Yet in this seemingly hopeless situation, a miracle happened. 42,000 people came together. There was a reason this wall was built in 52 days. Do you know what it was? I mean, who does that? This, this type of unity is almost unheard of. Almost. We are not normal people. You see, for many reasons, we're a peculiar type of people. This attribute is just one more on the list. The people of God have never done what is natural because we aren't what the world sees as normal. Philippians 2, 2 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. I remember at my old job, all the, the framed pictures and posters, I, they had one for everything. You know, they were, they were supposed to motivate you. You know, don't stop when you're tired, stop when you're done. You know, oh, I was just getting ready to go home. I was tired and frustrated. I was just going to leave. Now that I saw that, I'm going to stay. Failure is, is success in progress. But my, my favorite is the Michael Jordan one. And I actually do like that one. It's the one where he talks about all his missed shots and all his failures, which drove him to be great. But anyway, if that kind of stuff motivates you, cool. What motivates me is seeing those, those sayings in action. Seeing those things lived out. Not seeing a quote on a wall. And keeping it in the context of this sermon, I was thinking, what, is, what does unity look like? What does the world view as unity? So, of course, I Googled it. And, and these are the first few images that Google gave me of what unity is. Okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I think the, the star one's pretty cool. What would you say? Teamwork. Teamwork. What would you put up? What picture would you put up of what unity is? The best examples of unity shouldn't be a poster on a wall. The best example of unity shouldn't be a secular symbol or team or concept. It should be a picture of Christ's church. We are called to be the example that everyone looks to of what unity looks like. Teamwork, cooperation, love. The best example should be us. It should be the church. Because unlike all other people, we have something that gives us an unbelievable advantage over all other people and teams 
This isn't a story of how God empowered one man to build a wall all by himself. It's a story about how God united a people to do together what they couldn't do apart. Not everyone could move a stone. Not everyone could defend with a sword. Not everyone could lead a team or a nation. But everyone could follow God's lead and find a place in the common work to ensure success as they moved in the same direction for the same cause, the same purpose, and the same outcome. Our commonality is our obedience to Christ. That is what unites us. But don't miss what also divides us. It's dividing churches as we speak. It's why we have so many different kinds of churches today with so many different confusing uh, uh, belief systems. Listen, we are to be obedient to the Word of God. That's it. Jesus said in John chapter 17, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by your name, by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. We are hated because we, we read and teach the Bible and what it says, not what the world wants it to say. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. You have sent me into the world. I have sent them into the world. What we see happening everywhere is churches giving in under the weight of the pressure of worldly influence and change and whether they will be obedient to God. Which technically, that's been the issue from the very beginning. It was the issue in Nehemiah's day, and it's an issue in our day as well. Will we be obedient to God's word? Right and wrong is not up for a vote, but our obedience is. When we are obedient to God's word, we will be united. And when we're not, it not only destroys us, but it divides us. The way, the way and our objective is set, our message is unchanging and clear. Our methods may change, but the message stays the same. And not only that, but we've all been given gifts by God to unite us in, in the cause for which we strive under the Lordship of Christ. In every era, God's people have to wrestle with this same question, and so must we. For Noah, it was a boat. For Solomon, it was a temple. For Nehemiah and the people, it, it was a wall. What's our project God gave us? And what part do you play in this unified effort as we push to the finish line toward the end of Nehemiah? Do you know what it is? And if so, do you know your part? And if you do, are you doing your part? I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus Christ. Is the Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him. And I accept him. As my personal Lord and Savior. As my personal Lord and Savior. Jennifer Wolf, because of your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life. We want to offer you that same chance this morning. If you are at a point in your life where you are ready to unite your heart with Jesus as one, we want to offer you that opportunity this morning. Or if you're ready to place your membership here with us at First Church, we want to give you that opportunity as well. Or if you just need prayer, we're here for that as well. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer?
Dear God, Lord, we thank you for this time that we had to come together this morning to listen to your word. And God, I just pray for unity, God, for the world, for our church. I pray that the Holy Spirit would move throughout this congregation to bring us together. Lord, we can do some amazing things in your name. And I pray for the guidance, and I pray that you would empower us to do those things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.